So hello, good morning, everybody. Um, Borada, Crossel Palp. I'm Amy Nicholas. I'm the project officer for the Transport and Health Integrated Research Network, also known as Think. And today we're really pleased to invite three speakers to come along and talk about the role of electric cargo bikes in the UK. And they're all coming at it from slightly different perspectives. So um, just a few things. If you go back to the top of the chat, we have got a link to joining the Think Network. So some of you here might have found us through something other than being a member of Think already. So if you click on that sign up link at the top of the chat, you can join us and find out about upcoming events. One of those upcoming events is the Winter Conference on the 13th of December, which is gonna be hybrid. It's gonna be in Cardiff and also online. So you can get your tickets for free there already, again, at the top of the chat. And if you do have ideas for presentations and you'd like to do that at the conference, either live by video link by recorded um, presentation or by in person, there is a link also at the top of the chat where you can submit your ideas for presentations, posters or exhibition stands. Without further ado, I would like to hand over to Harry Tainton and Jack Neighbour from Sustrans, who are going to talk about their eMove project in Wales. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, I'll just share my slides. Okay. Can everyone see, is that okay? Everyone can see that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, I thank you, Amy. Um, I'm going to just give a bit of a summary into the move scheme um, and then Harry is going to then talk a bit more about the statistics and our findings um, but yeah I'll, I'll provide some context first so yeah eMove is a um, Sustran scheme Welsh government funded and it runs in five different uh, Wales so rural average of Newtown and Swansea and essentially, the scheme is just an electric bike loan scheme where we give residents and businesses in those towns an opportunity to borrow an e-cycle or an e-cargo bike for a, for a length of time. Um, so the idea of the scheme is essentially to see if we can find solutions to transport poverty, to people living in more isolated areas or areas which are just not well served by public transport. Um, so we've essentially chosen those five focus towns based on the Welsh index of multiple deprivation, um, which essentially show, which essentially tells us um, which areas are hard, harder hit by transport poverty and other um, things. So yeah, the e-cycle loans last for about four weeks. Um, it's completely free of charge. Um, and at the end of this, before the scheme, they do a survey and after the scheme, they also provide post loan surveys so we can compare um, their thoughts and experiences of these cycles before and after the scheme. Um, but yeah, I'm really here today to speak about the e-cargo part of the scheme. Uh, so that focuses on Aberystwyth and Swansea. We don't provide the e-cargo loans in the other focus towns. Um, and each cargo bike is loaned out to an organisation or business for three months. Or those, they do kind of typically go over by about a month or so. Um, just because it's based on demand, just we're not really going to take a bike on unless there's um, a reason to. So yeah, um, the idea of that is essentially to help businesses move away from reliance on uh, vehicles. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, target. We do have a target audience, and we do like prioritize different users. So in terms of businesses, we prioritize smaller, um, small medium enterprises and also um, community initiatives as well. So, uh, yeah. I won't go into too much deep detail about the e-cycles because uh, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a variety of different e-cargo bikes that we loan out to people. So depending on what the business or organization wants to use it for, um, they can choose. So we, have, yeah, so we have people who do delivery. So the bikes on the left are a bit more suitable for that. We also have bikes that we loan out to people so they can do like rubbish collection. Um, in Aberystwyth, we have a project where they use the bikes for um, food surplus. So they go around supermarkets collecting waste and taking it to an allotment. Um, and they use the Bergamon at the top right. But also we have these XYZ bikes down the rear, I'm um, sorry, down the bottom right. 
and they're they're quite useful because they're customizable so we've got a business in Aberystwyth who's using it to sell chai tea from but also other organizations use it for advertisement so they take it to events and they can kind of set it up as like almost like a table and use it that way so we do provide like a selection of different e-bikes because obviously every single organization and business has a different need um so I'll talk a bit about the project delivery and how we, you know, manage the scheme and run it. Uh, so the first thing we did when we got to these focus towns was we reached out to pre-existing organizations and stakeholders. Uh, so there are quite a few organizations in these towns of ours that are like are already interested and in integrated into like cycling communities, but aren't necessarily well equipped to um, promote it themselves or even, you know, use an e-cargo bike. Um, and but we'll get into the barriers later or harry will anyway so the first day is yeah um just reaching these towns promoting the scheme and and basically talking to different organizations about what we're planning to do um we organized a couple of events in these focus towns so we did some promotions and demo we, we continue to do these promotion events and demo events because they're a good way of getting more people signed up to the scheme and also more you know businesses interested um and then phase two was essentially just like hiring the staff to run the scheme um so obviously five project officers for each focus town although at the moment there's four project officers because i'm currently covering Aberystwyth for fan newtown um and of course you know making sure that the bikes are well maintenanced and and up to scratch so every six months the bikes need maintenance and then they have a more serious uh, service a 12 month period okay. and we do offer quite a lot of training support when people take out a bike so every single bike uh, every single beneficiary will have an induction um, at the start of their loan and we'll run through the basics of how to operate the bike um, but for our loan they'll get a lot of attention and can contact us really whenever they need us um, um, uh, yeah essentially and yeah, we do lead rides, buddy rides, basically to encourage and motivate beneficiaries to use a bike because you don't really want to give out bikes and then find out they've been sat in the shed for you know three months at a time. So it's good to get out of them and, and basically like, yeah, kind of push them into using them and they'll eventually get into it so much they just do it on their own accord. Um, so the last phase, the, the final phase, is essentially to send off our reports to Welsh Government. So all the data and information we've collected and um, some of the uh, more qualitative data that beneficiaries and provide us with, we then formulate into a report and then we send it off to the Welsh Government um, and you know, hopefully extend the scheme and help the communities themselves um, run their own scheme in the future once we're gone. So the scheme's not really meant to last forever, it's more yeah, it's a pilot scheme. So I'm just going to talk about some examples. So I mentioned the Aberystwyth of Chai bike earlier. And you can see in this picture, uh, the Chai bike's in the middle, but we do have quite a few um, bikes going on Aberystwyth at the moment. And what's really nice is a lot of the beneficiaries form this kind of like smaller community with their e-cargo e bikes. And they kind of work together. Um, so we've got Sally says, I want my business to create a sense of well-being and bring happiness to people. It's already given me a new sense of purpose. The business and the bike have allowed me to reconnect with the community I call home. The bike is symbol of the business is my shop front. It's essential. I'm excited to see even more of the new doors it will open. So yeah, so for Sally and a lot of these businesses, the like the aesthetic and like the brand identity of using a cargo bike is quite important. Um, especially if they're like, smaller businesses and they're just starting off, it gets a lot of brand attention. Uh, we've got uh, the cargo bikes up in real. So we've got Alex who helps out the Rural Community Bakery. Because I'm happy to say that using the e-bike has been easy and convenient, but fast, simple to ride. It's really helped me get around town in no time. I felt safe and secure using it. Being able to put the baskets and signs on has helped with visibility. Um, I've had people looking and commenting I've been cycling, which is great from a marketing, marketing perspective. A lot of people have also asked uh, me about it when the bike's been sat in the training room. So I've been able to tell them about the e project as well. So yeah, once again, all about that brand identity and i'm talking about new town so even though the scheme's meant to really be is focused only on Aberystwyth and swansea sometimes we do extend loans just outside that you know, of our remit so this is a horticulturalist who's running a nursery just outside new town 
and um, they essentially just use their bike to work on their nursery, do all their gardening services. And then once a week, they'll transport their um, produce down to the market in Clandlois and also in Newtown um, via bike. And they've actually sold their car. They had a Land Rover to do this all in. And they've sold Land Rover in favor of using a cargo bike and actually now saving their own bike. Um, just because they said it's really helped with brand identity and they have way more people coming over to see their store than they did before. Um, and it saved them a lot of money, cost, obviously. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm just going to pass on to Harry, who's now going to talk about um, some of the stats and the data collection side of things. Uh, brilliant. Cheers, Jack. Um, hopefully that's a seamless handover and I'll just talk through this quickly. Um, so my name is Harry Tainton. and I'm a senior evaluation officer in the research and monitoring unit. Um, and it's, yeah, my job to kind of get all the uh, data collection for the project that Jack and the other project officers have run really smoothly and evaluate the impacts we can report back to Welsh Government and understand that we're um, doing the good work we want to do and that e cargoes and uh, make the difference we want to see. So a little bit on the data collection. Um, quantitative, we used a pre and post loan survey that looked at trip purposes, changes in travel behavior and contributed to how we did a carbon emissions reduction. We also had a startup called C-Sense provided GPS trackers that went on all the bikes. So we could look at the trip lengths for every journey made by the e cargo bikes. And this also went into calculating the carbon emissions reduction. We also conducted interviews with a lot of the organizations to have more of a qualitative understanding of what the e-cargo bikes meant to them. So that's the impact on health, well-being, future intentions, perceived barriers, et cetera. So some top 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 line headlines. We loaned e-cycle e-cargo cycles to all organizations, heavily weighted towards the small micro end of of organizations um, and we saw 171 weekly car van trips fall to 65 during the length alone um, so that was from a subsection of that 31 so there was only that's from seven organizations that completed a pre and post loan survey so just bear in mind these numbers are for seven organizations not the 31 so you know they more than halved and e-cargo cycles rose from 12 to 102 during the loan so almost 10 times with the average cycle, e cargo cycle trip being 4.3 kilometers and an estimated 425 kilograms of CO2 saved. These are sort of um, a bit of a wall of numbers, but I think the kind of key statistics here would be there's a large, there's a, there's a large spread in the number of trips organizations make, obviously dependent on the loan length they make. There's a large um, range in loan length from seven days to 365 days. I think standout ones here would be the maximum distance for a single loan. So this is the amount of kilometers that a single loan completed in their loan length was 705 kilometers, which is about a quarter of the total kilometrage of all distance traveled. So I think the highlight here is just the variability in which organizations use the cargo bike and how much it means to them. Um, you can see the kind of um, trip duration, you know, varies from you know, 10 to 44 minutes. So these aren't whopping great, you know, multi-hour journeys. They're, they're all under an hour. Some of the barriers that we came across were storage capacity on the bike itself. So that it's going to be limited to what you can actually carry. The price of the e-cargo cycles, uh, secure parking and keeping the e-cargo safe at night. It's not like a van which you can leave out on the street and not worry about it um, as much. Distance and time. Staff buy-in, so whether or not everyone at the organization would want to cycle an e-cargo bike or feel confident cycling it. Um, and safety, with one organization saying dangerous roads mean I could not travel further afield. And these are some other quotes, one to support the cost being a prohibitive factor. And another, again, reiterating that traffic, not difficult to navigate as an experienced rider, but if you're less experienced, it can, um, it can be quite off-putting and infrastructure is lacking. Some of the benefits are reduced travel costs. So after that initial outlay, a lot of organizations said it was actually cheaper doing their freight delivery because um, you didn't have fuel costs or like parking costs. 
quicker journey times because of being able to cut through traffic and access more areas. Improve staff well-being because, you know, <laughs> it's not nice sitting in traffic. It's good to be an active and provided nothing bad happens on a cargo bike, it's probably a more pleasurable experience than driving a lot of the time. Um, and improve inclusivity for <laughs> reasons mentioned before the call, actually, between the other presenters, this idea that you don't need a license to participate you know, anyone can do it in terms of regulations. It's not the same as a van or a car where you need insurance and what have you. Um, and 8% of organizations, which I think is pretty put it, said they would like to buy an e-cargo cycle after the loan period or bought one during the loan period. I'm just going to give a mention to public perception because of the next slide. But a lot of people said it was good for the profile of the organization, opened up conversations and was generally positively received in the community. You know, all in all, it was good publicity. People liked it. Which brings me to influential factors. So we asked organizations before the loan what they would consider as an influential factor in effect in their ability to use an e-cargo. And then we asked them after, after they'd used it. So one was a sort of expectations versus reality of what they thought would be influential. So the blue is the before, and you can see that there was a handful of things that people thought would have been very influential, but then no one considered them influential after the loan, suggesting that these might have been um, the things that people expected to be difficult but actually weren't. So hills with an e-cargo bike, not really a problem. Distance, not really a problem. Staff skills or training, not really a problem. And then there's other things where actually they were quite accurate. So, you know, 40% said the weight and size of goods to be transported could be an issue and about the same number said the same after. Um, I'd like to highlight three because whether not really not really on our control and public perception as mentioned before was actually a good thing so this this was influential in a positive way like making people more likely to use them weight and size of goods is down to the business but i think the thing that stood out to me is the active travel infrastructure quality you know this feeling of safety on the road cost influential because it reduces cost but that initial outlay is prohibitive for businesses and again employing fitness i don't know what we do about this but hopefully once more people cycle in general and you know as e-cargo bikes get get better employee fitness becomes less of an issue uh, as a barrier to entry. So I think these are the biggest incentives that would improve e-cargo uptake amongst small organ small medium enterprises. In theory, this lot in Wales at least should be taken care of by local authorities and the active travel fund and local planning policy. You know, this should be on the increases the years go by and the active travel fund delivers more and more high quality active travel infrastructure. But the question for me is, what's going to be the economic model that helps organizations overcome that initial outlay and make e-cargo bikes part of their part of their business as normal. Um, so future research at Sustrans, definitely Welsh government are interested in taking a gender budgeting approach. So for the third year of e-move that's currently ongoing and will be written up um, in March of 2024, it's understanding if there are gender related barriers to adoption of e-cargo cycles in workplaces. But what I'd be interested in, and I guess, working with the SIG network is understanding economic models for subsidized or grants to e-cargo cycles for small and medium-sized organizations. Um, some large organizations like your Amazon, the Hermes are getting e-cargo bikes as part of their fleet. And I just want to understand and make sure that small, medium enterprises aren't left behind and every hurdle there is, they are helped overcome with um, devolved government in accessing e-cargos and perhaps quantifying the benefits to staff health and well-being using e-cargo cycles as opposed to cars and vans. Um, it was quite a common theme, this idea of increased independence, increased well-being using e-cargos as opposed to vans. And there's a lot of statistics around um, absenteeism is reduced when you cycle to work, for example. I just wondered if there's a gap for similar research. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Um, any Q&A at all? Brilliant. Thanks, Jack and Harry. So if anybody got any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can come off mute and ask a question. I'll give people a minute. Um, whilst people are thinking about that, I can't see any hands currently. Um, I did have a question about how you think it could be more accessible for people to purchase these things, because obviously if you buy a van, you can get a loan and pay it off over time. Is that something that people could do with the bikes or is that something that's available at the moment? Maybe you don't know. I personally um, don't know. Jack can weigh in or I see Will's got his hand up. Well, <laughs> go for it, Will. 
Yeah, so yes, um, there used to be a massive obstacle uh, and was like an obstacle for us as an, as an organization. Um, I could have gone and got a small like Citroen Nemo style van, like £100 a month, um, but I couldn't get finance to buy a, 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 a 8,000 quid cargo bike. Um, but that's a real change in, in the industry now. So there are lenders and organizations who are manufacturing vehicles who are prepared to um, provide that finance to make those sales. Um, so really interesting. Um I think something uh, that was really valuable to see all that information um, and kind of tallies with what what I would would how I would have felt being experienced in using these bikes. And um, I think really important is that if there is a role like to people that there are standards which are associated with that. Um, and what I can say from an industry perspective is that um, there's a bunch of operators like myself. It's four of us who are sort of the, the peak of what we're doing, and we're involved with the Bicycle Association. Um, and the European and UK Cycle Logistics Federations, where we've taken best practice throughout Europe and we're putting together um, standard operational procedures um, and, and, and that expectation that people would have before operating these. So uh, operator standards. So as a business, if I've got these, I pledge that, you know, I'll have this standard of bike, this standard of training, um, this standard of equipment, this standard of maintenance. Uh, and as a rider, someone riding that in an organization that I will ride it like this um, I will look after my bike like this and I will obey you know road laws that, which are like this so those are things which are really developing which I think will um, add a lot of support to these sorts of projects and sort of galvanize that and reduce some of that initial risk I think for for operators before coming on board. Great thanks for that insight well we do have a question in the chat how did you measure well-being was it interview or questionnaire and did you take any more objective health measures? Harry. So we had um, some questions in the survey that had before and after questions on a kind of, is it the Griff uh, Reef um, measure of well-being? So, you know, do you think your standard well-being is at this level before and after? And then we went into greater depth in interviews um, with participants who volunteered their experience of how their well-being had improved along the sense of increased sense of independence or you know just more exercise and fresh air clear their head um, but nothing objective in, in a sort of no like um, monetized health outcomes nothing nothing like that thanks Harry might be a gap in there for any researchers on the on the call who want to follow up Great, so if we, if there's got no other questions, I can't see anyone else with hands up or anything. Graham, can we invite you to do your presentation now? So Graham Sheriff from, he's got some examples of electric bikes, cargo bikes being used in Manchester. Thanks, Harry, if you can stop sharing your slides, I think, Harry, we can swap over to Graham. Thank you. Thank you, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just trying to share my slides. I'm hoping everyone can see me showing PowerPoint. Yeah, thank yep. you. Right, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Graham Sher from uh, Arida at the School of Health and Society at the University of Salford. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a bit about Greater Manchester, but also sort of give some general reflections on, on having been doing research on, on this and related issues for a while. Um, this particular piece of uh, research um, was actually something I did with some colleagues, Luke Boschayeski and Nicholas Davis. Uh, Davies, uh, rather, um, in 2020, um, and as with academic research, sometimes you do this research and then you really want to kind of update it and you don't quite get the opportunity yet, but hopefully that opportunity is coming. Uh, but the, the piece of research we did was very interesting because it was in lockdown and actually there was quite a bit of kind of uh, activity around e-cargo bikes as a response to lockdown, which I'll come back to. But I've also been doing research on um, e-scooters uh, bike share and low traffic neighbourhoods in Greater Manchester. So we're kind of like putting these in the context of that kind of ongoing research, really. Um, the I, I should mention there's a report, an academic paper, and I'll, I'll give you a link to those um, at the end of the presentation. Um, for the um, for the academic work, we used a, a, a conceptual framework called multi-level perspective. And in the academic paper, there's a, a horribly complicated version of this diagram, but basically it's this. It's the idea that there's kind of three levels. There's the landscape, which is a relatively kind of stable kind of a representation of sort of global trends. So sort of, sort of uh, digitization, uh, 
kind of neoliberal markets. And then the regime is the kind of the, those kind of um, stalwarts, such as the kind of the car, the van, the, dom the dominance of um, of of cars and vans in in, in our economy. Sometimes like, people call that kind of automobility regime. And then niches, which are kind of um, fighting to kind of join the regimes. And, and we we argued that e-cargo bikes are a niche. And um, I, I gave this presentation at a conference, international conference, and someone said, well, they're not a niche where I'm from. I'm from the Netherlands. So they said, definitely the Netherlands. And they're not a niche there. They're all over the place. And I thought, well, yeah, that's good. Um, and I feel, you know, I, I guess we could be getting to the stage. People might argue that in London, for example, they're not a niche because we're seeing them much more. And I, I think since doing this bit of research, it's grown so much um and that's why you know really want to update this research a bit but it's just growing so much even what i see on the, on the on the roads in greater manchester and i know much much more in london having just heard the previous presentation um but during during lockdown then in 2020 there was two um services which which were started in greater manchester what well this one actually is just on the outside of greater manchester in todmorden uh, cargo dale where they were looking at doing deliveries in a so for those who don't know todmorden is a kind of small town it would be seen as maybe peri-urban or rural. Um, so hilly, <laughs> in cycling terms, hilly, basically. Um, whereas Chawton, on the other hand, is an area of Manchester, which is nice and flat in cycling terms, um, and where there's lots of um, kind of thriving local businesses. Um, so the, there was these two schemes. One, the Chawton bike deliveries, which you see here. This is a recent um, newspaper article about them starting in 2020 and really growing into a, a, a much more active uh, small business. Um, who do all sorts of things from deliveries, but also kind of community services or community contributions rather with this kind of try such or uh, service taking people out and about, which is great. Um, and these are some of the shops that they work with. So you can see a wide range of different shops and services that they're working with in, uh, so a lot of them based in Chawton or Manchester. Uh, so, so it's really grown and it's great to see that um, and over the last few years. And the other thing that's really just to show some of the stats that they're, they're saying here. So for 40 or 41,000 uh, van miles avoided uh, is what they've estimated. So that's quite an impact. Um, we also had Cargaroo. I don't know if, how many of the cities had Cargaroo actually. We had it briefly. They were kind of on pavement. You could pick them up on, on pavements, uh, hire them and take them around. But unfortunately we don't have those anymore. Um, it, I, I guess take up wasn't high enough. Um, and we have cargo bike libraries. This is one being run by Salford um, City Council, where businesses can get and try out a cargo bike. Uh, what we've also seen massive changes in the, the bigger companies uh, engaging with cargo bikes, and we see now on the streets, um, and more so in London, uh, Amazon and UPS uh, making deliveries by these vehicles, which are, are pedal powered, um, e-assisted. Um, and I think we can we can estimate that this is about companies partly trying to be green, appear green, but also trying to cut costs and in the in the climate as well of things like the, the low emission zone that we're seeing in London, they recently introduced and in Manchester there was discussions about that, but a decision hasn't quite been made yet. Um, so one of the things we, we started doing in our discussions and our research was around uh, a set of focus groups with uh, people interested or um, using e-cargo bikes. And at the time, it was mostly people interested in e-cargo bikes because it was just the nature of, of, of the situation at the time. And the reason we argued that there are niches is a, a novel, as your quote at the bottom says there from someone uh, we spoke to, you know, people don't know what they are, they're very unfamiliar, that potentially has changed quite a bit. Uh, they're very um, unfamiliar in terms of business practices, but it's something that's kind of a bit, you know, a bit unconventional businesses have to get their head around to use. There's a lack of kind of specific consideration in infrastructure planning. Even when we're planning bike routes, we still have to kind of argue that there should be consideration for these larger uh, vehicles on cycle routes. And that the price, we had a big discussion about this. They, you know, they're not expensive in the grand scheme of things, but because there's such a, a developed secondhand market for vans, they often are uh, much more expensive for that initial capital cost and um, more difficult to get finance. But as we heard in the last presentation, that's changed. It's now easy to get finance um, in some situations. So that's great news. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why people are interested in using them. So this this example with Oxbox, so in some people we spoke to in, in Oxford as part of a kind of wider bit of the research, uh, they were they were sort of the, they were partly about the kind of, they, they were in, into the idea of cycling, but also they, they commented that they were remarkably efficient around the centers. Um, 
another uh, interviewee told us that they were uh, could use them on hospital sites because they had kind of internal distribution tunnels where you couldn't take vans. So they saw a use for e-cargo bikes to do that, which I found really interesting. Um, but, you know, we also have to be realistic that people say, well, we're thinking about using them, but we're not really sure uh, because of the range and the volume that we can carry. And I think that's, you know, we just have to be very aware of that. But I think over the last few years, we sorry, the wind is suddenly really noisy by the window here. Um, the last few years, we've, we've really seen um, some examples where the, you know, the, the range and the, the volume, the, the, the capacity rather of, of these vehicles has really improved. Um, but I think also when we talked to people about, you know, would they would they try e-cargo bikes? They were saying, well, actually, if you're not kind of um, used to cycling, uh, you're probably not going to want, want to do it. And I think this is where it really emphasised that there, there are multiple barriers to cycling. We we know them all really. The, um, the main one is road traffic. And actually people were saying, well, yeah, I feel unsafe on a bike, but I feel less safe on an e-cargo bike because it's unfamiliar. It's a large vehicle. It's more difficult to manoeuvre. And so on. So we saw that real challenge of of, of winning people over towards these uh, vehicles. Um, and even some of the the really confident people we spoke to said that they wouldn't always take the biggest bike out, even if it meant they could take more stuff with them, because they were just sick of uh, you know the aggravation in the traffic of trying to manoeuvre some of the larger vehicles, uh, which which I found really interesting. Um, there were also a kind of cultural one. We we're speaking to people about would their company introduce more e cargo bikes and try and um, move people away from from vans onto e cargo bikes uh you know people say well it, it, we we wouldn't want to give the impression that it was demeaning that people were asked to you know it was like a, a you know the opposite of a promotion really to be asked to go onto a bike uh, so some really interesting kind of cultural things and i think this this quote which became the title of the paper we wrote why would you swap your nice warm van when you can eat your butties and listen to the radio why would you swap that for a bike uh, sort of just emphasize it's not just about carrying capacity the van is not just there to carry cargo it's actually like somewhere where people have been spend most of their day they've got stuff in there they've got their lunch sandwiches the radio and so on uh, so it's not just about how much a bike can carry and how much you can co uh, cover how much space it can cover but also about that kind of sort of the, the van being the home or you know the, the office that the mobile office and so on uh, which i think is a really interesting challenge so just to sum up um, and i you know, I've been very general in the presentation, really. I've not gone into detail on the results and be really interested in, in, in talking more generally about them, really. But, um, you know, I think it's a niche technology in practice. But but since 2020, when we looked into this originally, it's, it's been such substantial growth and that just brilliant, really encouraging. Um, we didn't really de demarcate the kind of personal and business use, but I think they're quite different. Uh, for personal use, if you're buying it to, to transport family or transport goods uh, in your personal life, um, I think the, there's some different barriers, and, and I think one of the main ones I hear from people is storage. Uh, is you know living in a, a terrace house, for example, there's literally nowhere to put one, so it's a bit of a different challenge. And that's why those kangaroo bikes were potentially still really good. Um, I think the we spoke to people who wanted to try them out, so that opportunity to do things like the cargo bike libraries, those sort of approaches where people can try them out for a bit, is really valuable because it, it is quite it is. Quite Quite a big investment still um and you know it's a big change for people so i think it's uh, really important to, be able to try them out um the the barriers as we, we all know and you know we all look into this stuff the barriers to cycling are quite well known and i think the barriers to e-cargo bike use are the same and then potentially more so uh, more so uh, in, especially during road traffic but i think there's a kind of communications job to say well actually you know, because you've got the e assist, actually, they may be better, they may be more inclusive, as you, as you pointed out in the last presentation, that they could be more inclusive um, because you're not expecting people to have a, the same level of carbon endurance, especially if you're out all day doing deliveries. Um, but those barriers are not just practical, it's not just about road safety, and it's sort of and it's not just about range and cargo, it's also about do people want to ride a bike? Are they prepared to ride a bike? Uh, are they going to swap their van? And we didn't speak to anyone who would actually got people out of vans onto bikes. We got people got people onto bikes because they were already keen and they wanted to cycle. And that, that's great. But are we talking about a bigger uh, shift where we're saying to companies, right, you know, to retrain your van drivers and turn them into uh, delivery cyclists? Is that that's that seems like a different question. Um yeah, that's and the the point about a van being more than cargo, I think sort of just hammers that that point that that the, the the van is more than just carrying stuff. It's also where people uh, you know are sheltering, eating their lunch, listening to the radio, all that stuff. Uh, can we offer something like that uh, in cargo for cargo bikes? Um, 
So yeah. I've ended with a lot of questions, as I always do. Um, but there's um, some links there if you want to look at the report and the paper that we wrote, and I'm very happy to discuss further and answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Graham. Um, if you've got any questions, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand, as we said before. Um, does anybody from the other presenters want to come back on anything that was raised? Will, <laughs> go for it, Will. Okay, yeah, it re that's really, really interesting what you're saying. Um, I think when we first started our business, we were a bit of a joke. Um, I thought people, you know, we'd literally have people saying to us, you'll know you're doing all right. Uh, we'll know you're doing well when you've bought some vans. I think that, you know, they, they didn't really realize what we were doing. Um, and as we've, we've become real competitors um, and we begin to steal that business um, from them, that we're, we're no longer a joke. Um, interesting what you're saying about um, reskilling drivers, some, some work we're doing with a, an organization in London um, where that's what we're doing. We're removing um, lorries from um, central London and we're putting uh, cargo bikes in their place. Um, and it's not really been seen like that. Actually, the, the the team operating on those are just glad to be out there doing some work. Conversely, City of Westminster bought a pile of sort of four wheeled cargo bikes with little roofs on. Um, and essentially what they've created is 15 places where people can sit doing nothing in the rain. Um, so there's a, there's an element of that as well, you know. So um, the cargo bikes are in their place are excellent. Um but there, you know, I firmly believe as an organization that um, it sort of aces in their places. They're really great at some stuff um, and they should focus on that. So I think what's the stat that 50 percent of all freight um, in cities can be moved by a cargo bike. Um, so if you were to do that, you know, it's significant. And if you look at vans and how full they really are, there's some really interesting stats on that. So vans are net, well, very rarely more than 50 percent full. So, but I think that's, that all of that information is really, really useful. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I say it's it's changing so rapidly. I, I feel like you know when I'm presenting this and thinking, well, I know I know it's changed, you know, rapidly. And um, I think the point about you know it's great to hear that they're also um, finding ways to sort of encourage drivers to retrain. Um, that's brilliant. And yeah, the, the these newer sort of um, uh, cargo bikes with a roof and the shelter. I mean, that's really looking at that issue isn't it and i think because what we did was, was focus groups for people who were sort of making decisions for businesses so often they were reflecting their own prejudices and saying well no our drivers wouldn't go in a, on a bike and you know we don't know how much they'd ask ask their drivers that uh, so it's, it could be their own prejudices about not wanting to push it with their staff but actually that the staff may have been quite open to it or some of them anyway they're old industries. These are old industries which have been driven by the same people forever. Um, and now things need to change. Um, but ironically, if you go really, really far back and remember, you, you know, your butcher or your baker, they had someone going out on a bike to do the deliveries. OK, so there is like a bit of stuff in the past we can look to as well. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Does anyone else have a question? I can't see any questions in the chat. If not, we'll move on. Could I, could I ask a question? Yeah, Sorry, go for I'm, it. I'm, yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're in um, Sydney, um, and, the, you know, we're, we're way behind where you guys are. But one big issue is infrastructure. And can any of the speakers just give a bit of a, a comment on, you know, what are the in infrastructure implications? Are you running these on, in bike lanes or are you running them on the road? How, where are they operating? Yeah, I'll just come in on, on that quickly uh, first. So the comments we received were, were relating to the kind of width of cycle lanes. You've got some very narrow cycle lanes, very narrow turning circles. And um, also you get kind of barriers that are put in for uh, which are meant to deal with antisocial behaviour and probably don't anyway to stop people kind of motorbikes going into parks and, and onto cycle routes and that kind of stuff. So those th those were the things that were really, really highlighted as as it's kind of short-term thinking in a way that when you, you're designing cycle networks, you design them, you end up just designing them for, you know, uh, quite confident cyclists, whereas actually you need to say, no, we're designing these for, for a range of vehicles, including adaptive bikes for disabled people and e-cargo bikes. Yeah, I, I mean, can I add on that? Um, that from an operational perspective, we would train our riders and expect them to be able to ride a bike on an A-road, and we'd expect them to be able to use the cycle infrastructure. And that's the advantage we can gain. So, I mean, that's our real operational advantage. I'll try and cover some something about that in my talk now. Um, uh, I think that um, when we are, we definitely see in Hereford that the local authority has embraced what we're doing. 
So when they build cycle infrastructure now, they speak to us. And if you look at the bollards on some of our cycle paths on the left-hand side, one of the bollards will be slightly wider and that's to enable our bikes to go through. So um, definitely the advantage to early adopters now is you can use everything, um, but that's going to be interesting to see how the industry moves now as the cycle lanes become more cluttered. Will they need dedicated lanes for cycle freight or who knows? So, but yeah, um, good, great question. But thanks, Tris. We have one more question in the chat. Um, what is the average range on an e-bike? Anyone can chip in there. Uh, depends how big your battery is. Depends how hard you're running it. Depends how hilly it is. Um, uh, depends how much assistance you want. But um, it will be probably more than enough than you need. So you could probably run it on the biggest amount of assistance with the bike fully loaded and you could run it for 25 miles. Anyone else have a bit of feedback on that? Sounds like it depends. <laughs> one of the yeah. one of the answers. Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, I'm Steve. I work for Sustrans Cymru. Uh, obviously, I've got got a couple of my colleagues on the on the call as well. Um, just a question to to the panel. Um, <clears throat> we've been part of a roundtable of Cardiff Council, and they've they've actually set aside you know, a reasonable amount, fifty thousand pounds in this year's budget, to foster more cargo bike usage. So we've been trying to, you know, help them work out the best way to spend that money. What, any ideas of what they would do? I mean, some of the things floating around is, you know, they could they have a locker in the middle of a city centre where they maybe buy one or two cargo bikes to have them there. Um, you know, offer short term loans to to businesses, work with specific businesses. You know, there's lots of different ideas there, but you know, they still haven't spent it. So any any ideas that we could feedback? You're on mute, Graham. I'm muted. So from, from um, the point of view of pe the people I've spoken to, I would say that those kind of libraries or kind of short-term loans are really important and some kind of, for want of a better word, training. I mean, you know, to give people confidence, those seem really important. But um, those are just my starters for 10. I'm sure people have other ideas. Anyone else want to chip in at this point? Sounds like storage is a general issue unless you've got your own big company with a lockup somewhere um so if we we're kind of a little bit short on time so if i let will go i know he's been giving you the his wisdom already but if will can give his presentation then we can mop okay. up any questions um, at the end thanks will all right um so okay um everyone see that i'm sure it's fine um I'm Will Vaughan. I'm from a company called Petty Cargo. Um, we do, we have an award-winning pedal-powered infrastructure company, right? So we do all sorts of stuff by bike. Um, that can be parcel delivery for companies like on that Yodel, DHL, could be trade waste recycling, um, could be inner city advertising. Or we, we would hire rituals out as well. So I'm going to go through a bit about how we got to where we are, maybe use a case study um, and then there's lots of pictures, so if you're getting bored, at least it's going to be nice and colourful for you. Um, so how am I going to do this now? Um, right, so here I am. This is us 17 years ago, and we launched with my best mate. We launched a rickshaw company. So um, we've both been doing some, running some expeditions, doing stuff like that. A few beers thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get a rickshaw to the next pub? Turns out no rickshaws. So we bought two rickshaws, licensed them as Hackney carriages. Um, and the idea was we wanted to, people to tip us what they thought is worth for a trip. So um, just a sort of idea. We wanted to get involved in green transport, wanted to see what was happening. Um, and it worked pretty well. Here we are six months later. Um, we've had our like thousand customer and we've paid off our, our in initial investment. Um, but that just grew and grew and grew. Um, so pretty soon we were doing delivery work. Um, and that was all sorts of delivery work, maybe for council, council post, bits of last mile for people, stuff for bakeries. Um, we also use our vehicles to balance mobility schemes. So we're with a company called Beryl to do that. Um, and we balance and manage uh, full mobility schemes using um, cargo bikes. Um, so we don't use any vans to do that. Um, we run a big trade waste recycling um, project in Hereford. So we have about 400 customers. Um, it's quite interesting, I've just spotted this. It's a UPS van in the back, going down the wrong way down the road there. Um, so, and here we are using all of our lovely cycle infrastructure to service businesses. Um, so the, the trade waste thing is really interesting because um, it's a sort of 
old school thing um lots of bulky items um but we're able to offer a really low price service using cargo bikes and get to the door and improve service um we use all sorts of vehicles these are um trailers that we make um ourselves so we, we're sort of trying to standardize units and size we use um this is a prototype of trailer its code name was bin laden um and he's he gets towed by the weapon of mass collection um but I think when we sell it, we'll probably have a we'll probably version two or something like that, um, something a bit more boring. Um, so the thing here we've got is that we have this capacity where we can move a huge amount of volume. So we've got 4,000 litres um, there, uh, maximum capacity, something like 400 kilograms. And there we are, trucking. On this road here is um, the Contrafoe cycle path going directly into our historical town. Um, we've got loads of streets like this. And imagine like being a organization with a huge bin lorry trying to service this. It'd be a nightmare. And um, we don't have to worry about it. Everyone on this street is one of our customers. And um, so we have loads and loads of streets and um, which are really difficult to collect from. But we're able to provide services to them. And the beauty of a cargo bike in this position is that um, it's not producing any, any emissions. In this particular environment, it's not really damaging the grain either. Um, is safer for the environment. And look, there's some nice smiley people doing some nice work. Um, those bins we collect, um, we've got hundreds of them. So there are hun literally hundreds of them around our city. Um, we've serviced all of the recycling from people like our local hospital. Um, and when all of those bins are full up, if you compact everything in it, it makes this, that's a ton of cardboard there. Um, and that's Lewis, he's not doing anything there. Um, we do loads of cool stuff with the products we get. So we have a great circular economy type thing where we collect glass. We made a machine called Darth Grader and he turns the glass into an aggregate and that aggregate is then sold to, to local builders. So we stop that um, glass traveling hundreds of miles away from our city. We capture it, we process it, we create jobs doing that um, and then we resell. So there are loads of really interesting methods we've got into and we think about that because our operational cost is low and um, so we can get hold of some of those products and we want then we want to think about what we can do with it and um, same for um things like metal recycling so we do some really cool stuff here where we collect computers and we strip them down um and we sell on the minerals and stuff from those um and we have other projects like this we, this is soil from the city and um, where we collect um, vegetables from happy looking chefs and turn it into compost. Um, this is a really big one for us. Uh, so from a um, carbon saving perspective, obviously we're reducing uh, carbon by using cycles, um, but waste is a huge one. If you can redirect it from landfill, you have saving some serious carbon um, with food. Every ton we stop going to landfill saves us about four tons of carbon. So really significant. Um, so onto the sorts of bikes we use, um, e-cargo bikes. Uh, the advantage of an e-cargo bike for us is when we started, there were no e-cargo bikes. There wasn't even really cargo bikes. Um, there was one guy called Mike Burrows making them in the UK. Um, and we had sort of rickshaws and we take the backs off the rickshaws and put these contraption sort of boxes on during the week. Um, and it was really difficult because the only people who wanted to work for us were keen cyclists. Um, and they came with some specific problems. Um, like all they wanted to do was ride bikes fast. Uh, they weren't really bothered about the work we do. Um, but basically e-cargo bikes are amazing. So it means we can employ all sorts of people. So we have a huge diverse workforce. We have um, kids who are off to university doing gap years. We've got, you know, 50 year old mother of three. We've got all of these different sorts of people working for us. So the e-cargo bike means that we can broaden where we work. We're not too worried about our terrain. We can open up our um, operational area. We can reduce our costs. We're, we're faster on them. Um, we don't worry about range, which is an interesting question. Um, we can carry a hundred and something kilograms on that bike and a battery weighs a couple of kilograms. So just take another battery or like we've got a mode we can do where we can plug a couple of batteries in. Um, but they're amazing for us and they give us a real opportunity um, to offer services at reduced prices and be competitive. Um, like I said in one of those chats earlier, uh, we've sort of seen a bit of a joke to start off with um, and we're definitely not joking anymore. So people are really, you know, they're competing against us and they can't. So we're, we're growing. Um, 
at a, ra a very rapid pace, which is brilliant. Um, and our key concern is how we manage that and how we ensure our training and infrastructure is correct for that. All our bikes are named, um, some there. A wheel I am, Crank Bruno, Shania Chain, one of our latest ones. Um, so everyone gets to name their own bike. So interesting on that van question earlier on. Um, everyone's got their own vehicle they look after. So they do their pre and their post bike checks on them. They're responsible for how they operate, their servicing regime. Um, and all of our operators are trained to a level on certain types of servicing. They can swap brake pads. They can do stuff like that. Keeps us operating well. Um, and then we, we work with a cycle hub who we foster in our depot. Um, we offer the main the maintenance on one of the mobility schemes. They run that, um, and that gives us an on hand sort of mechanics team. Um, key bit is keeping the bikes operational. What we're finding as an organisation is we're pushing the bikes probably harder than um, they were anticipated um, to be operated. So we have some parts which might fail after five hundred miles, um, but we're working with those operators. Um, we're working with those manufacturers to help them test those, those pieces of equipment. So really interesting to be at the front of the market. Um, so I thought maybe we should talk about something pertinent um, or a particular project. So we run a loop for our local hospital for um, their pathology department. Um, that involves collecting samples. Um, well, you can guess what those samples are. Some are, some are nicer than others, but... Um, if you come and work for us, you, you might have the privilege of doing a five-day urine sample, which is good. Um, so that's important that all bikes can be um, washed clean and that sort of stuff. Uh, but um, basically what we have in Hereford is a terrible problem with getting stuff around the city. Um, and the pathology department have had a couple of problems where they couldn't get samples from the GP surgeries to pathology in time. And we'll get to that in a second. So this is Hereford. We have about 180,000 people live in Hereford. And in this bit, the city, which is a historic walled city, and there's about 90,000 people. And this is about five kilometers across. Our depot is here. And all of these blue lines and all the orange lines are dedicated pieces of cycle network or quiet streets. OK, so we have a lot of methods of crossing our city. And um, we're going to just have a look at something here. There's a massive river runs through um, our, our city, the River Wye which means that there's only one bridge here if you're in a car. Um, we, however, have got loads of bridges. We've got one here, one here, we've got one there. So we've got four or five ways of crossing that. Crossing that. Um, so our life gets very easy. Um, to make this worse, this is a trunk road, the A49, and there's no bypass. So all of these sort of quadrants here get backed right up, notably worse at um, times when schools are on. Um, so how does that factor into our little pathology loop? So here's a hospital, um, here are all the GP surgeries, um, here's our local authority building, and here's their buildings as well. And every day, a van was driving, or two vans were operating full time, driving around here, collecting these samples twice a day and getting them back to this red dot, so samples and post. And when we are able to do that with one bike, and it goes out for two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. Um, so we're improving their service, we're reducing their, their costs. Um, and also it's just a sort of much more effective way of doing it. Um, so the pathology department, how that's operating is we've got a team will go in there. We're authorized and signed off to have access to post rooms and things like that. So we've gone through quite particular sort of security with them, which gives us the direct access to do that. And um, we work directly with that uh, pathology department. Everything we're carrying, um, so that five liter urine sample isn't just in the bike, um, it's actually in a special secure box. So we're compliant with all of all of the um, legislation and security for those operations. Um, and really that gives us these distinct advantages. And um, so we can guarantee we're on schedule, okay? So even we factor into our operations, how long things will take, and then we factor in like a disaster time. Um, so we've always got an ability to self-rescue within the business, trailers or bikes that can rescue or help our staff when they're out there. Um, but we factor that in, we've got a puncture or mechanical, you know, so we know we're gonna be able to hit uh, hit on time. What that means is we can offer competitive services, it means we're cheaper, we're faster, we're greener, we're generally better because we're more involved and more engaged with those organizations. Um, and that, that work's been subcontract to us. Interestingly for pathology in this particular department, when they were operating vans for that work, they didn't know what was going to happen. So if there was a breakdown on the A49, the one road crossing the river, um, it might mean a, a, a van was stuck on there. 
and they'd have bank staff waiting in pathology to stay on in the evening just in case those those samples got back late um, and there was a huge saving brought to the nhs um, by by avoiding the need to have those bank staff there so there was an overall net lower cost and that obviously passes on to those people as well it means that there's faster return of results to those patients so loads of really really interesting things which came really just from bikes doing the work instead and um, over here in this picture, Hampton Dean Surgery, you can see our bike and hide in behind this wall, see a little bin. So for us, we also have like a, a gain in our services. So the bigger we get, we've got a share between things. So I had a shot here as a trailer and this bike will have collected this bin whilst it was doing this pathology loop. So we're sort of getting double bubble on that. We're getting um, delivery work and recycling work done at the same time. And um, so here's some stuff. Um, when we started as taxi no, rickshaws, we had to break it to our parents, we were taxi drivers, and then we were delivery drivers and then bin men, but some really good stuff happened in that time. Um, so these are sort of success, success things that happen. Um, we won some awards. Um, we won a Prince's Business Award, a Pride of Herefordshire Award. We rode a bike from Hereford and delivered the Queen's Business. Um, and the, we delivered the Queen's birthday card on her 90th birthday. And we did a bunch of other stuff, right? So we go and talk at festivals. We talk at things like this to tell people about the advantages of um, of using cargo bikes. Uh, so what next? Um, it's not that, um, but that is something that, is, that people are using cargo bikes for. Um, for us, this is interesting because it isn't one of our bikes, but it's got a petty cargo logo on it. This is a company in London. Um, and we've helped them by deploying bikes and training and apps and that sort of stuff to enable them to do work. So we help over a thousand bags of rubbish a day get moved in in London. So we've taken our skill set and we've introduced that to those um, to those organisations. Um, other stuff we do, we're really involved um, in our local city and our local town about um, you know bringing investment and proving what we can do. So. Um, this is part of something called Stronger Towns, um, and we've been involved in bringing sort of over over forty million pounds worth of match funding to to the city, um, and and we can do that um, because we've really got a good voice. You know, we work. Um, we've been doing our work for seventeen years in in Hereford, and we're ingrained in in um, the city. Um, so we've got a couple of. Um, so I'm wrapping up now. We've got a couple of. Um, sort of morals, I suppose, that we always live by, fun, green and honest. So I think before, which sounds a bit cheesy, but before we worked, um, you know, running our own company, we were under a lot of pressure. We were working for organisations, maybe we didn't think we're doing the right thing. And um, we decided, we, you know, if we run a company, we want, it, we want it to be good fun. We want it to be green and we want to be honest about what we're doing. So interestingly for you, you know, there's a, one of those contracts I talked about earlier on was a, a delivery contract we ran for a company called Yodel. Um, a sort of largely gig economy based delivery um, and they would drop thousands of parcels to us every morning and we would dispatch them on bikes um, and eventually it's a pretty big decision but we were doing 150,000 plus items from a year and we decided we didn't want to work with them anymore we didn't value what they were doing that we didn't think they cared about what we did um, and we thought that the way they were handling the gig economy um, and getting operators to work for cheap wasn't right and we didn't think they valued our service so i think important for us to sort of point on this now that one of the key parts for us as an organization is how people are going to use cargo bikes um properly and efficiently and safely and effectively in their businesses and and that comes back to something i mentioned in the, in those chats earlier um we work with the uk cycle logistics federation um and the, the bicycle association at the moment to look about how we build um uh, an operation standard and, and method of conduct for, for operators to use bikes. Not something that is restrictive, but something which is constructive and enabling to allow people to use these bikes safely. And um, we're on the verge, we think, if this isn't done right, of a sort of cargo bike pandemic of all sorts of bikes being used wrongly in the wrong sort of um, places. So the advantages of cargo bikes you can get anywhere. Um, you don't need a license, but there's disadvantages. So you don't need a license. You can't get prosecuted. You can do whatever you want and no one's really going to do anything bad about it. So it's important for us to set a benchmark and to do the best that we can, um, which pretty much wraps it up. Um, so that's the end. Um, we've got the, this page left intentionally blank is because, um, you know, we've got some plans what are going to happen in the future. But what I do know over the, over the last sort of 15, 17 years, 
the thing that's enabled us to be good is that we've been flexible and we've relied upon the skills that we've got um, to develop. So it's a real privilege to be here speaking to you um, today about what we're doing. Um, and it's fascinating to hear about the research which is being done. So I think it's really constructive. Um, so yeah, that's all for me. Um, any questions, I'm willing to take them. Thanks, Will. Um, Michael. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for really interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I'm from Sydney, by the way, uh, like my colleague, uh, Stephen. Um, my question to Will is um, about whether the cargo is best in front of the rider or behind the rider. So I noticed all his bikes have the cargo in front, but uh, yep. the Armadillo quadricycle has the cargo behind. Uh, what's it, what, what are the advantages of in front or behind? Right. So we do tow, we tow trailers, so that, that way is behind. And um, if it's in front and the box is big, it's quite easy to get that through a gap. So it's easier. So we have a less, uh, we have a lower hit rate on bollards, I would say, on something that's in front of you because you can see it and see where it's going. Um, and another advantage of physically operating with it on, on the front of the bike, if you do multiple deliveries, is as you stop the bike, you're, you're actually getting off the bike to the front of the bike. So, you know, those, those sort of micro bits of saving. Um, we can see the cargo if it's in front of us as well. So if you've got an open cargo bike, um, it's easy. You can see that or if you've got children in there, um, for instance, you know, there, there's an advantage to it. Um, in the physics, I don't think there's much in it, um, pull or push, um, really. Um, and for us, what we think the, the the biggest next step for cargo bikes is being able to tow with a trailer. It's the, it's the quickest and biggest way you can improve your... Um, improve your capacity, double the size of your fleet without um, necessarily impacting massively on cost. Uh, Thank Steve. you. Thank you. Stephen, if you want to go next. Yeah, um, that's really, really interesting, Will. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, on the cargo bikes, and obviously you had some there, like the bin laden trailer, which was, looked like they could potentially carry like yeah, quite a lot of weight, but <laughs> there's a there's a legal limit right on the i think it's 250 watts for electric mo yeah. electric assistance is that a problem and um you know do you think it should yes be really no. sort of, yeah so there's, a, there's a legal limit between the, the the combined assistance of a trailer so so there are some trailers which are electric assist which are tag along so there's a, there is a legal limit and um, i think that um it's not necessarily that much of a problem so for us pulling 400 kilograms is not a problem stopping it is right so that that's the thing legislation needs to be needed for ensuring that, that you know it's safe and you can stop those vehicles effectively um if you were if i had a nice walk around london tomorrow i would tell you that 60 percent of the vehicles i saw were illegal i would tell you that they're operating illegally i'd tell you that there are big manufacturers who are operating illegally and selling I would tell you that some of those four wheel bikes should are not legally allowed to be on the road. And what they're hoping for is legislation change, which enables them to go from not being a pedal assist to just being a low powered electric vehicle. And um, that this is some stuff which is coming in the future. I think in five to 10 years, maybe there will be vehicles which are, are doing that, maybe carrying 400 kilograms, doing 25 miles an hour used in cycle lanes um, or 25 kilometers an hour, not, not pedal assist. And I think there's, there's potentially a place for that. Um, but at the moment, I don't think that um, I don't think that actual power assist is, is a problem currently. Harry, do you want to go next? Uh, thanks. Yeah, there's maybe two questions. I apologize. But it's basically off the bat. That was really interesting. And it just kind of really got me thinking. So, well, I mean, it seems like you're very much like kind of maybe I'd say early adopter, maybe you'd use a different term and you are probably years ahead of where a lot of other organizations are with e-cargos and it's really great to see. And it's also nice that you are like bottom up rather than like a large existing logistics company that's incorporating e-cargos as part of their fleet. So I wondered if there was three barriers that you faced and how did you overcome them to become so successful? Because I, I agree, I don't think they are a niche technology, like you said but you are miles ahead. So why isn't everyone else doing this if it's ready and ripe to do would be my first question. Right. And the second one would be, um, I think you're right. There probably needs to be some standards set for like road safety. Um, 
you know, it's maybe a little bit wild west, as you say, with like yodel and how they're treating their gig economy workers. There needs to be some standardization. So it's actually seen as like a respected, safe career yep. path. But given that there's already a lot of organizations that could benefit from using e-cargos, but aren't, is there a risk that legislation and training being a legal, you know, requirement is another barrier for them to overcome along with cost and actually prohibits other organizations from doing what you've done? Okay. I'm not saying that's true, but is there a risk? Right. Um, okay. First question. I would say that um, some of the biggest barriers that have, that we've come across in growing are cost. Um, definitely cost of buying bikes, like uh, cost of running them, cost of you know, there's been there's a maintenance failure. Where'd you get a motor from? You know, the, the market was too small at that point, and um, so it was hard for us to get spares and parts. No one actually made these bikes, um, so those were, were big things that the, the technology wasn't there. That's what we've seen in trailers and things now, which is why we're making our own because you know we actually we can't we can't find anything that does what we need to, so we have to we're at the front of the market, so now we manufacture it. But I think for us, um, definitely the the cost of things. I think a perception of people. So I think that there was a that project with pathology. You know, we it took us probably a year, eighteen months to actually get that off the ground, and we were having meetings about you know GDPR about how we would all of these things about um the safety of the sample you know and you always come down to someone saying well it's a bike you know what if some steals it what and you're like well what if someone steals your van you know what if i follow your van driver around and i see that he's left the keys in the ignition and he's gone inside to get a sandwich or something right it, so all those vulnerabilities that exist currently so it's about assessing them interpreting them assessing the risk and and replacing that so so i think a perception of safety ability Safety, ability, and capability was a big thing for us, um, and, and cost. Um, and then I think like training as well, because no one was really doing it. We were fortunate in that we'd come from backgrounds where we'd had to do sort of some things that were dangerous, and we'd had to make sure that they were safe and safe for other people to do. So we were confident in risk assessing properly. We were confident in um, you know, optimizing ways of minimizing, minimizing risk. Uh, and so we were writing those standards very early on. Um, and I suppose that um, that leads in for me into is, is training a barrier. Um, when we talk about this from an industry perspective, we don't want to create something that is a barrier. We want to create something that enables um, people to do things. So you get someone on a bike and we'll train them and you give them a basic piece of advice or something really basic about how you put the bike on a stand you know, make sure it's facing uphill. And that stops the bike rolling off the stand into the car into a live carriageway. You know, like st really, really basic things, which are actually about operate operational safety and about um getting the most out of the physical item you've got to do do that delivery on or, or use it. So these are not things which we think should be prohibitive, but they'll be prohibitive to large organizations because what they will have to do is put in a dedicated training network and they will have to put into that somebody who's got their name on it saying i'm responsible for this so when you so we've signed up to these conditions and if you see my four-wheel cargo bike parked on a pavement you'll know that it's been pedaled up there because you can't push it up there and i'm liable for it um and that's really, really important. So we want to create a, a group of people and a, a body of people who want to set examples with this. We, you'll never solve everything, but what we need is a, a good amount of people setting a, a solid example. And um, so that goes to Amazon or Yodel or whoever's using them. But they, these, it shouldn't be restrictive. Training should be about enabling people to do it and do it well and getting the most out of that asset. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Brian, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Will. Yeah, it's really good to hear about all you're doing. Um, my question builds on the training issue, I guess. I was wondering about recruitment. How do you approach recruitment? Do you ex do you require people to have a certain amount of cycling experience and ability, or done uh, bike bike ability or anything? Uh, no. So th th this is one of the questions in the standards at the moment, where there's a sort of expectation that people would be at bike ability level three. Um, I one, I don't really think that's good enough, um, and I think for, for what we're doing and two, I don't think it's personal enough to, to that. And um, so we would expect in recruitment that we would train someone from nothing to being able to ride one of these bikes competently. And um, they will go from riding their bike around the car park 
to riding the bike on the delivery to progressing to riding alone to progressing to riding with a trailer to progressing to riding with considered loads and then everyone will reassess every six months as well so those things are are, are absolutely vital but from a rec recruitment perspective it's positive you know we're saying that we will train you to be able to do this and if you can't you know and it, and it doesn't work out it doesn't work out and um, recruitment for us is isn't really a problem um we've if we go on to it if we post an indeed post we have too many people applying for the jobs we have and majority of people who will apply will be word of mouth or people who will approach us directly so interestingly as people see what we're doing and as people are concerned about the environment they'll want to make a move towards what towards working for us but we have a huge variety of people that work for us great thank you